Welcome back, shalligators. <gasps> Are we gonna talk about anxiety today? God, Kendall Jenner, sweet Jesus, this woman. We're gonna talk about Kendall Jenner's new Vogue um, interview, which seems to be centered around her, one of her two favorite topics. Actually, don't worry, she brings them both up. Tequila, which as I have stated and will state forever, I have never in my entire life seen or heard of another human being who isn't her drinking. I've never heard of anyone drinking her tequila, but like, okay, cool, whatever. And of course, her, fa her most very favorite topic, anxiety. I mean, I have been watching the Kardashians fairly religiously for, it's actually embarrassing when you add up, it's embarrassing. So I just, let's just leave it there. I've been watching them religiously. And you know, if you, you can come up with some adjectives about Courtney, Kim, Chloe, Kylie, we're like, huh, uh, like for her personality, but let's go with like glam or I don't know, Kendall, the only word that has ever come to mind with her is anxious, sour, kind of ungrateful, boring. And girl, you can't say it's a bad edit because it's literally your mom who's doing the edit. So if she doesn't have your back, you know, honestly, if that is the case, if your mom is editing you to make you look bad on her own TV show, I would be anxious too. So I should stop this video right here because suddenly I am on Team Kendall for why you would just be a ball of anxiety if your mom was like truly your greatest arch nemesis. Like, girl, fuck. But let's say that that's not the case. I think we can all agree that Kendall's big personality trait is her anxiety. So guess what she's talking about? Yep, here we go again. So we're gonna break down what she's talking about. Am I giving her an unfair edit? Do you appreciate that even someone in her incredibly gilded life is dealing with just the nameless dread of anxiety? Or are you like, bitch, read the room. Think about it. First, we're gonna take a quick look at today's sponsor. You are special, you are one of a kind, and you are a VIP, and you deserve that kind of treatment from, oh, let's see, everyone on planet Earth, including your healthcare. Nurex is a digital healthcare platform that makes it easy for you to get customized, private, and ideally tailored solutions for anything that involves your skin, from anti-aging to acne, melasma, and everything in between. Because let's face it, by now we know over-the-counter stuff doesn't really work, and who wants to call on the phone, a dermatologist's office, make an appointment, drive down there, girl, no. Wouldn't you rather be in your pajamas getting access to 50 different dermatologist tested, medical grade acne or anti-aging solutions? I would. So check out Nurex's team of dermatology experts who are here to guide you through your skincare journey so you can be your best self. And hello, did I mention? You're gonna have 24 seven support access. Is your doctor in town saying that? I don't think so. Go to Nurex.com slash Shallon Lester to get started. That's N-U-R-X dot com slash Shallon Lester. Results may vary, not offered in every state. Medications prescribed only if clinically required and results may vary. Thank you to Nurex for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the gossip. Okay, we're back with Kendall. We're talking about anxiety today. So Kendall was on the cover of Vogue. The cover is amazing because it's like, Kendall Jenner proves everyone wrong. And one of you guys, because I always ask on Instagram, what's the topic here? You're like, what has she proven us wrong about? She's exactly who we thought she was. Like, you know, if, if it was Kendall proves us wrong, if that's the headline and I'm like, okay, what, what does that mean? It, I would open this and she would be in the jungles of Zimbabwe. Does they have, I'm sorry if they don't have jungle. I'm sorry if it's an arid nation. Volunteering, digging wells, inoculating babies. No, no, no. You know what she's doing? Complaining. She's dressing it up as most of these pain influencers do now. When they're talking about their mental health, they're, they're acting like they're being brave. What they're, to me, what they're doing is they're complaining. I do not appreciate a victim narrative. And I feel on some, on some sense, I feel like mm, kind of like bad saying that because in many ways, people feel very alone when they're struggling with their mental health, you know? But I think when you make it such a central part of your personality, it's really just self-aggrandizing. You're not doing it to inspire anyone else. You're doing, it's just masturbatory. You're doing it to just talk about your feelings, be narcissistic and selfish. And what the fuck is anxiety? What is anxiety? Self-absorption. 
Um, <laughs> you've never dealt with it. Sweetheart, yes, I have. First of all, I got, I've been like canceled, you know, like I've had my address posted. I, like I understand anxiety on a level some people don't, you know, I, I have bypassed some hardships that I will never have to know or endure. It's not a contest. My point is I have experienced it. And when we actually can get enough clarity to break down what anxiety is, yeah, a lot of times it comes back to self-absorption. What are they going to say about me? What's going to happen to me? Me, 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 me. That's the, that's the good news and the bad news, is when it all funnels down to ourself, well, a lot of times that means we have more control over anxiety than we think that we do. We're gonna get into all this in a bit. We're gonna really dig in. I wanna talk about what Kendall said. So, you know, people come out with these interviews and, and spreads and magazines and everything. Um, first of all, can we just look at some of the photos? I need to understand what this is. Who told her to do this? Who told her? To, who told her to wear those shoes? She looks like she's got flippers on, and like, what? What is this? Is she? Is she a black belt? I read the article. I didn't see anything in there. Maybe I missed it. Where she's like, I'm a, I'm like a purple belt. I don't. Bleh. Okay, but you know, celebrities do these interviews, and news aggregators, Page Six, Daily Mail, TMZ, they pull out the juicy bits, and a lot of times they pull it out out of context because it's like they call it the pull quote, and it's catchy. And so I thought, okay, like this anxiety thing, I feel like this is just the pull quote. Maybe it was like a few sentences, but it was kind of juicy. And maybe she was talking about her tequila that again, no one fucking cares about or like fashion or that's not that juicy. Nope, nope. It is almost the entirety of this article. The article is titled, Kendall Jenner is in her feelings. Here's some quotes. I'm gonna to try to do her voice. I'm not gonna sit here and act like everything's perfect. That's life. I'm always gonna be in and out of those feelings. That's my problem. I'm a negative thinker. I'm always worried about something that may never happen. Okay. I don't see why I shouldn't be honest about it. In my career right now, I feel really stable, really hopeful. I know she doesn't exactly sound like this, but kind of. Compared to Kim, Simon, but I've had a tough two months. I haven't been myself and my friends see it. I'm more sad than usual. I'm way more anxious than usual. So I'm not gonna sit here and act like everything's perfect. In past interviews, when someone's asked me about my mental state, why the fuck are people constantly asking you about that? Could it be because you are always talking about it? I have interviewed a ton of celebrities. I've interviewed Oprah. I've interviewed Gladys Knight. I've interviewed Miley Cyrus, Kim, everybody. Never once has it occurred to me to be like, hey, tell me about your mental state. Unless it is something they would be bringing up. And she does. I remember like her whole arc on the Kardashians is anxiety. Like when, when she first became a model, mom, I'm having a meltdown on a plane. And I remember this because Chris was like, uh-huh, sweetie, get on the plane. It was like ice cold. And I could tell Chris was like, not this shit again. Not this shit again. You know, I don't want to fucking hear it. I don't want to go out. I'm anxious. She was having anxiety on a family trip. She was having anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. <sighs> I'm going to keep reading. In past interviews, past interviews, when someone's asked me about my mental state, it's always been, I'm great right now, but this is what I've dealt with. Well, right now I'm actually in it. Okay, okay, let's unpack, let's expand that. Let's expand that because what she said, what she said, I think is very telling. I've always been, I'm great right now, but this is what I've dealt with. Victim narrative, victim narrative, ah. Do we need like a victim gong? Bang. Someone who is truly in their gratitude place, someone who is truly aligned, someone who is moving forward and not backward, someone who is the head and not the tail. When someone asks, how are you? They say, I'm good. They don't say, but hold on, hold on. Here's what I've been through because I need you to pity me. I need you on one hand to see me as very put together right now, but I also want this reserve, this sort of slush fund of pity from you to draw upon when maybe I need a little card to play. When I wanna be a little manipulative, when I need extra attention or love or control, I want you to know that I've been through some things. Red flag, red flag. 
Now, please do not misunderstand me and say that I want you to engage in some sort of toxic positivity. I'm fine, everything's always been fine. No, I want you to do two things. I want you to either process what you've been through, move through it. There's a difference between being victimized by something, which is very real. I mean, we're victimized by things all the time and being a victim. To be victimized has a start and an end. It's a, it's a moment in time. It might be a long moment in time. It might be recurring moments in time for sure. But you do not make that who you are. It is something that happens to you. It is not you. It is not you. Okay? That's what I want you to do and realize. And I also want you to acknowledge that these things you've been through actually didn't kill you. And therefore... Since they didn't kill you, we can say that this is cliche, did it make you stronger? You know what? There have been a lot of things I've gone through, and I'm sure you too, where it's like, no, it actually didn't make me stronger at all. <laughs> it broke me, it scarred me, um, but okay, but it didn't kill you because you're here. No, I know that it didn't. Um, I kind of wish it had <laughs> at some point, but it didn't. And I'm still here. It didn't make me stronger. Can you find a way for it to make you smarter? Because you know what you can't do? Erase it. You can't erase the abuse, the breakup, the medical report, getting fired, the frenemy betrayal. You can't. You can't change what happens, but can you change what it means? Can you change what it means? When I read this quote from Kendall, what I hear is, I, I, want, I don't want to change what it means. I want the bad things I've dealt with to continue to be viewed as bad, okay? I'm not going to really get any learning out of that. I don't know that I'm gonna get a lot of gratitude and I know that she's not getting gratitude because she's bringing it the fuck back up again. And she's always going to touch back to her being victimized by something versus, you know what? I'm great and it is because of those bad breaks that I feel really strong. Those are really hard. That whole Pepsi commercial thing, which is so cringe, but that was really tough. But you know what? Here was a silver lining. I got way smarter about the deals that I make. And I, I learned like more about my brand. I don't know, like whatever the fuck she got out of that. That's not what I hear her say. I hear her say, I'm doing great, but oh, but hey, but hey, mm. Joel Osteen has a phrase, it didn't happen to you, it happened for you. And boy, oh boy, to inhabit that, like that to me is like Buddha level consciousness. Oh, well, I mean, technically, I think he means his Jesus level consciousness. <laughs> but it's like, if you can like come up to this level and be like, that didn't happen to me. I mean, it did, but it happened for me. I mean, I remember when, like when I've gone through things, I, I will have this moment where I'm like, why is this happening? And it's not like, why? I will have that moment too, you know? But it's a, it's a place I pass through. I, it's a moment, it's a moment. I will have it as a moment. I will not have it 24 seven. And then I get to, from why is this happening to, okay, hold on. Why is this happening? Six months from now, when I'm through it, I bet there's gonna be a moment when I'm like, oh, that's why. He had to dump me so that I could go on a road trip to Arizona and meet this guy at like, like a truck stop. At, okay, that's a bad example. You're not gonna meet anyone at a fucking truck stop. I don't want you to do that. But you know what I mean? So many things in my life that have made no sense and been so painful. <laughs> In the moment, I can look back and be like, wow, who knew? I mean, one of the hardest things I've been through is getting canceled. Um, like I said, my address was posted and I had to leave New York. The FBI told me this was, not a, this was not my own paranoia. This was the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I moved to Montana, you know? And I remember, I remember a few months after I was in Montana, I had Cowboy, he was just my little baby puppy. I had a boyfriend, I had a truck, I had a house. I had a beautiful like space and land and rivers. And, and I was like, holy shit, that's why. What a blessing. 
kind of wish it'd been delivered in a better package, <laughs> you know, kind of wish. But look what I got out of this. Part of what I got out of this was the blessings of God. That was from the blessings of God. But I got to say, part of what I got out of it was me being like, I'm not going to let this be something that happens to me. I'm going to let it be something that happens for me because I can't change it. What choice do we have? I don't like feeling like a victim. It is gross to me. And people can come here and they can be like, you're a braggy douche. You know what? Someone out there is inspired by a braggy douche. Ain't nobody inspired by a victim. And if people are, it's only because misery loves company. I don't want anything to do with those people. I don't want them around me. I don't want them watching this channel. I don't want anything to do with them. Get those motherfuckers away from me. I am here for the braggy douchebags. I'm here for the climbers, the ascenders, the winners, the champions. And people can say, eh, you're braggy. Sit back down. That's where you belong. I get you don't understand what it's like up here in our rarefied air. You don't need to. We always need victims. We're always going to need pigeons, right? Somebody's got to eat the cigarette butts off the ground. It's not going to be the eagles. And so when I hear Kendall talking about all this, it's like, you know that meme where the guy has a cigarette and he's just like, ugh. Like, that's why I feel like I have like 10 cigarettes. I'm just like, oh, God, Kendall. So let's hear what some other stuff you guys had to say about this. All she talks about is her anxiety. Not much is wrong in her life, so this is her hill to die on. Stop being a complainer. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Ooh, how to get over your own self-mythology. Oof. This is really good because it, it, th this nails it. At this point, Kendall's mythology is that she's an anxious person, that it's my mental health. Every, everyone asks me about my mental health. That's weird. That's weird. And you know, on one hand, it, it is kind of inspiring and it's relatable because it just goes to show even someone like her with all the money in the world, all the power and the clout and the influence. And by the way, I've seen her in person before her like minor but significant plastic surgeries. I mean, she is otherworldly beautiful. She really is. She is absolutely unreal looking. Unreal. And what so many of you guys said was, what exactly is wrong in your life? But again, this is relatable because we, we apply a label to ourselves or someone else applies that label. You're a slut. You're a fag. You're a fat. You're stupid. You're lazy. You're not worthy. And the amount of time that those people spend saying that to us usually ends. We graduate. We move out. We break up, we quit. But for some reason, we pick up where they left off and we keep it going. I'm a slut. I'm fat. I'm not worthy of love. I don't deserve this. I'm an imposter. I'm always going to be this way. I'm anxious. I'm broken. And Kendall is such an interesting case study of how this can run amok in the face of every fucking blessing imaginable. Every blessing imaginable. And this is how she chooses to define herself. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. I could be having, well, you know what? <laughs> I have had like some of the worst days of my life were days when I did like a YouTube video or I was on TV about something. It's not what I talked about because I don't choose to define myself by those low moments. It's not interesting. It's gross and is antithetical to who I believe I am as a person. And it blows my mind that somehow it's not antithetical to Kendall and her own self mythology. I think that's, I think that's really weird and odd. Don't you think that's weird? That she fundamentally wants to see herself as this broken, anxious, depressive person. And you might be saying, that's actually not how anxiety and depression works. Like you have it, whether or not you want to believe that you have it. That's true. I'm not one of these people who is like, oh, if you have cancer, just tell yourself that you don't. Decide to live. That's I get that. But there is a difference, as we said, of being victimized, having the disease, having the anxiety, dealing with something, and being a victim. She's in this camp. You know? Speaking of cancer, I, I have seen people who get cancer and it is their entire personality. Even after they move on from it, mentally they're still there. Cancer survivor, cancer warrior, fuck cancer. And it's not coming from a place of I'm spreading awareness, I'm raising money. 
It's, I am still there. I was getting, for some reason, enough juice off of this victimhood. I kind of want to stay there. I kind of like it. And there, no one's going to tell you that. No one's going to be like, oh my God, the best years of my life were when I had cancer. <laughs> Everyone's paying attention to me and like <laughs> doing whatever I wanted. <laughs> it was great. Because like, that's a crazy thing to say. And if you make them say that out loud, they're like, what? Right? But yet, but yet, you see people who, it, who do seem to stay in that place. I'm of a childbearing age and I know people, their IVF journey, the rainbow baby, the miscarriage. I know a girl. She had a miscarriage. She was like it, three months along, which is a normal miscarrying like zone. You know, she didn't have a, a nine month miscarriage. Like it's very sad. She went on to have five children, five. Every one of their birthdays, there has to be another cake for the dead baby. That she calls it the dead, my dead child. Five kids, every holiday. Well, we really wish the dead baby was here. I'm like, are you, is this a fucking joke? Like you need to go to therapy. Like there is a difference between mourning and whatever the fuck that is, you know? And it's because if you look at, if you, I don't, okay. I'm not, I have some blind spots with empathy. You're like, I know that. Like, I, okay. I have blind spots with morality. There's, there, I don't feel guilt. Like there's just things I don't feel. And so therefore I can look at people like that through a much different lens because their games don't work on me. I can just see through them. Like I, my heart can go out to someone for that loss, but I can also be like, hold on, you, you switched into a different pathology now and you're getting some sort of emotional payout from it. Human beings do not stay in behaviors or situations that do not work. Hear this again. Human beings, we don't stay somewhere and we do not continue engaging in behaviors that don't work. And you might look at someone who's a drug addict and be like, <laughs> that doesn't work. No, for them it does. This is the difference. You define work differently than they define work, okay? You probably define it in a healthy way. A situation that works is fulfilling, uplifting, soul affirming, you know, lucrative. You're maybe getting laid, right? They don't. And it's fucked up because if you ask every, every person on earth, what's your definition of happiness? What's your definition of comfort? Comfort, people say the same things. But based on results, based on choices and patterns, no, no. You ask anyone, Tell me about your perfect partner. No one's like, um, abusive. <laughs> Lots of gaslighting, jealousy, control, maybe some hitting. <laughs> um, but at the very least, uh, very little respect. No one says that. Plenty of people are with people like that. We probably have been too. And people stay in those places because there is some emotional payout they're getting. Maybe it's pity. Maybe it's a reinforcement of their own internal negative tape loop. My father said I, I was useless. My father said I was worthless. That guy treats me exactly like that. It scratches this weird itch. And so we look at Kendall and we're like, what the fuck? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what created this because it doesn't seem to be like a family-wide thing. I mean, it is and it isn't given their, their public spotlight. I mean, to live the way they do, of course you would have anxiety. Like, of course. But Kendall stays there. It's not a moment. It's not something that, you know, it's situational and we deal with it. This is her. I've never heard Kim talk about anxiety. She did when she talked about her robbery in Paris all those years ago. That's not free-floating anxiety. That's th that's based on something. I mean, you know, that's that's PTSD. That makes sense. Chloe had all this anxiety when Tristan cheated on her and it was all over the news and she was fucking pregnant. That's like, hello? Like that is reasonable and pegged to something. Kendall, I don't I don't know. I don't know. 
I don't know. Seems to be a personality trait. And anxiety is one of those things where you're like, is it even worth talking about? So, okay, when I was growing up, we never heard that word. Like if you were anxious about something, you were anxious about like a student government election, opening night of the play, um, a test, or a sports game, or like a boy. Those are all specific things, right? Those are like things. And if you said, okay, so first of all, I grew up, oops. Okay, so it's important to note that I grew up in a, a nice community. I grew up in Irvine, California. Academics, holy fucking shit. Like people were getting 5.0s in high school. Not 4.0, 5.0. Academics were everything. I mean, we were ridden like, boy, oh boy. And so if you said, hey, I'm just really anxious about math, the answer was, well, I think you need to go study. Anxiety was a marker that you weren't ready. Anxiety was a clue. Anxiety was pointing you in a direction. It was a map. It wasn't, oh, go back to bed. Oh, let's get you a pill. It was get your ass out of bed, go study, go get another tutor if you have to, sign up for another SAT prep class until you don't feel anxious about that test. And then even if you do, if you still do, the day of the test, you can look yourself in the face and say, you know what? I did everything I could. I knocked it out of the park. I was pulling all-nighters. I was canceling this. I was, I, I did everything I could. Whatever will be, will be. We'll see. We'll see. There was, anxiety meant go faster. It never meant slow it down. Like that's, that, that was a crazy, that would have been an insane thing to tell people who grew up in my town. Oh, if you feel nervous about something, just don't do it. What? What? Because the parents in our town were titans of industry. I mean, my friend's dad invented LASIK surgery for God's sakes. Like th that is the level I'm talking about. Like half my school was Asian. You think those people didn't have any fucking pressure? You think those first generation, like those immigrant parents wanted to hear about their anxiety? Not even close. It's like anxiety is coming over from China in a cargo ship. I don't want to hear about your anxiety for the tap dance or something. Nobody wants to hear about it. That was the message. And honestly, most of us turned out to be fucking champions. I mean, people from my school are famous. They're millionaires. I know one who's a billionaire. They went Ivy League. They went USC. They, I mean, they're, they're incredible. Like, it's, it's just like, pfft. I'm a YouTuber. But you win some, you lose some. And so my point is, I don't think that that's a bad directive to give people. If you're anxious and it's about something, get your ass prepared for this. You're anxious about like the end of the world. Okay, start prepping, start growing your own vegetables. Stop medicating yourself. You're anxious about a social interaction? Uh, look in the mirror, are you well-groomed? Are you interesting? Are you diversified from a personality standpoint? Or are you anxious about parties because you don't have anything to talk about and therefore you're not anxious about a party, you are reasonably predicting the outcome based on previous data, which is, I'm gonna go in there and I'm not gonna have anything to say and people are gonna be weird around me. So get something to fucking say. I've told you guys this before, maybe just in the schlantrage, but my ex Tom, who's like quite the little drug addict, his big thing is anxiety. I'm dealing with anxiety. I was like, number fucking one, you're anxious because you're constantly hungover. That's why I don't really drink anymore. I mean, that's I mean, a huge reason. Like. I cannot handle a hangover. I cannot handle that feeling. Uh, 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 uh. No good time is worth that. And I said, but bro, your anxiety is appropriate because look at how you behave. You should be concerned about how people are gonna react to you because you're a nightmare. You're rude, you're incredibly immature and out of line. And so you wonder, I'm, I'm socially anxious. Good, that's a good thing. Again, that's a marker. That's, that's trying to give you some clues as to your behavior and point you in a different direction. And what are you doing instead? You're not listening. So, okay. Sometimes anxiety is the psyche trying to be heard. You don't need a pill. You need a quiet room. 
and you need a fucking backbone to listen to what your psyche is telling you. Aren't you glad I'm not a therapist? Aren't you glad I don't work at a suicide hotline? <laughs> right? Now, of course, there's some anxiety that's just like free floating. And it's like, it's coming from nowhere. The call's coming from inside the house. And that is truly the absolute worst because you feel like, you feel like your body and your mind are betraying you. It's like, what exactly is the problem? What's the problem here? I am listening to my psyche and it's just one like insane spook story after the after the next or maybe it's no story at all. It's just like it's in my body. It's like like I can feel it. It's like rushing through my veins. Listen, it could be things like um food sensitivities. Like I I don't eat dairy anymore and my anxiety like basically evaporated because I was just so inflamed by it and I guess that inflammation like my wrists don't swell and I don't get asthma. I went nuts. Like my, it it affected, like, I guess my gut bacteria, which affected serotonin production and on and up to my brain and bleh, you know, what I think of as a pretty good, like, if there were to be a magic bullet against anxiety, two, two bullets, gratitude and volunteering. Gratitude and volunteering. Wouldn't you know, those things walk hand in hand. I volunteer here in Bozeman. I'm a waitress. I am. Uh, at this little cafe that's a pay what you can cafe. I have my training. I get to do my first shift. I'm really excited. And I signed up for doing this when I was in like an anxious state. Like I was breaking up with my boyfriend and I was just, you know, you're just down bad. And I'm like, I, I am so, I'm so tired of my own head. I'm so tired of my own thoughts. I'm so tired of my own bullshit. I'm tired of his bullshit. I'm tired of mine. I'm just, I'm exhausted with thinking about myself. I mean, basically, and victim narrative people, they're never tired of thinking about themselves. And I'm like, I gotta get out of my head. What, what can I do? And let's just boil this down to a blunt way of saying it. Maybe it would be helpful if I were around people with real problems. Okay, fine, great. If you are nothing but a narcissist, you're like a purely evil person and you're like, I just wanna like realize how good I have it. So I kind of wanna be around like the poor. I don't care. Whatever gets you to that soup kitchen. If it's that weird, shitty mentality, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me, you know, just fine. Go, go do it. If that helps other people while also dialing down your own mania, cool, bro. The ends justifies the means. We are Machiavellian queens around here. That was not my, you know, my, not that it was not necessarily my mindset. I mean, you take it all the way to one direction. That's kind of what it is. But I was like, I, I want to like, I, I have all this energy in my head and I'm like a crazy animal that needs like, like I'm like a working breed, like cattle dog, right? And if you, it wants to be on a farm, herding cattle and nipping at them. And if you don't do something with that energy, it's gonna chew the fuck out of the furniture. And that's where I was at. I was chewing my own furniture. And I'm like, I gotta do something with this energy, okay? I wanna direct energy in a positive direction. And yeah, I could like take myself and get a massage. I could play tennis and great, do all those things, do all those things. But there was still enough excess energy that I'm like, I gotta do something not just for myself because I'm sick of myself. I gotta do something for other people. And yeah, you do get a sense of shame. You get a sense of shame. And you know what? Shame is, again, not an emotion I feel a lot. And when people try to shame me, um, I'm like, okay. The only time I feel shame is when some, a lot of people feel shame because they're not conforming to what society wants, what their religion wants, what their family wants. That I don't, that misses me like the broad side of a bus. I don't feel that. I will feel shame when I know I am not living up to my potential. That's when I feel it. And so for me to sit here, who, 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 my life is so hard. My boyfriend is stupid. Girl, your life is great. You are healthy. You have, I mean, 
kids that won't quit. Right. <laughs> like I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And we're all blessed in some way. We're all blessed in some way. Like the, the problems you have now, number one, I bet you were praying for five years ago. And some people, they would give everything they have to deal with your problems right now. And listen, again, I want you to be like, mm, just a little bit of that shame. All you have to have is an eyedropper. I want you to picture it like an eyedropper into the ocean. Just boop. That's all you need. That's all you need. I want that shame to be like a stop button on those negative thoughts, on that negative tape loop, on that victim narrative to be like, you need to stop it. You need to stop it right now. Okay? It doesn't need to be a full on lecture. You don't need to go into that opposite, you know, victim narrative of I'm such a piece of shit. How dare I? Oh, blah, blah. Because that's what my ex would do. When I would be like, you need to cut it the fuck out. You're 6'4", you're hot, you run a company, your family loves you, you're moderate in bed. Come on. He would be like, you're right, I'm a nightmare. And then it would be like off to the races in terms of shame. And guess what he wanted to do? Drink. Don't do that. Just take a little. Just enough to act as like kind of a spark to get you up and out. Helping other people. And if volunteering seems overwhelming or difficult, first of all, it's not, cut it out, cut it out. Call your local food bank. That's who I volunteer through. They always need help. It's like very minimal training, very, very minimal, you know? But if not, call your friend who might be a single mom. Be like, can I do something for you this week? Call your grandmother. She would love to hear from you. Call your mother. You know, call, you just walk around the neighborhood. Put up a flyer that says, hey, I've got two hours on Tuesday. Does anybody need help with anything? I'm trying to give back to the community a little bit. Offer to watch your friend's kid so she can go get a pedicure. Do something selfless. You're gonna be surprised how good you feel. And you know what? Hey, if you're like, mm, I don't wanna do that. I don't, I don't wanna do that. Uh-oh, Kendall, are you Kendall? Are you Kendalling? Are you Jennering? Are you actually loving wallowing in your victim narrative. And listen, you're allowed to wallow about bad things that happen. Again, I'm not saying like toxic positivity, nothing hurts. Of course it hurts. Feel it and like feel it. Really just let yourself feel it and then let yourself pick yourself back up, you know? And I I get that not everything that goes wrong in our life is a, a one afternoon pity party kind of thing. I mean, there's stuff that we deal with all our lives. But this is the question, are you dealing with it? Well, yeah, I'm going to therapy. Okay, therapy's only as good as what you self-report. Therapy's only as good as what you do with the advice you're given. If you're going to a therapist who's not giving you advice, don't go to that fucking therapist anymore. You need to do more than just talk, okay? You need action. Get some cognitive behavioral therapy. Get a mindset coach. I mean, I use Laura St. John, she's incredible. Like, I want to leave these bad places. I don't wanna stay there. And if you're hesitating to pull on any one of these lifelines, it's cause you are also getting a payout from this victimhood. What is it? What is it? I have a friend who's dealing with a drug addiction and she says it's anxiety. And finally, I'm like, you have not tried one single thing, not one thing, not exercise, not therapy, not volunteering, not meditation, mindset coaching, electroshock therapy, acupuncture, anything, nothing, except for drinking and pills. That's all you've tried. And when I realized that, I kind of washed my hands of her. It's like, okay, I'm actually not gonna take time out of my life to try to fix you. You don't want to be fixed. I have no idea why. I have no idea. Your life is a hellscape to me, but this is where we're at. And so if you're looking at a Kendall and you're like, okay, well, why don't we go on a hike instead of drinking? Cause you know, you're going to be hung over and then you're gonna be anxious. And they're like, no, they be generin. They be Kendallin. Wash your hands of these people. They're gonna bring you down because misery loves company. And you know what else misery loves? A fucking audience. Misery loves an audience. You know what we always say? Don't ask a clown why they're a clown. Ask yourself why you're at the circus. <sighs> Anxiety's a bitch, but you know what? So are you. 
And if there's going to be one bigger bitch on this block, I want it to be you. And I want you to defeat these things and not gaslight yourself and say that you don't ever feel it and nothing hurts and everything's fine. But I don't want you to stay in these places to the point where you be generin and this is part of your personality and this is a label you are now living. I used to deal with anxiety. I Get rid of the used tos. We all used to do something. I mean, you used to poopy in your pants. Do you bring that up also? Hey, you look cute. Thanks. But do you know what? I used to poop my pants. Try it. Try it. Because that's what Kendall's doing. Maybe that'll be her next interview. Okay. We're going to wrap it up. And you guys, we are launching two new Italy trips next week. If you want to be the first to know, because they're going to be super small, 10 to 12 people maximum, maybe even smaller. We're going to see. Um, go ahead and click down below. Enter your email to be kept in the loop. No spam, because I don't know how to do that. And I'm excited to take you guys to Rome, Florence, and Tuscany, and also to Rome and the Amalfi Coast. They're gonna be top notch. They're gonna be fabulous sisterhood, bonding, content creation, Aperol spritzes, gaccio e pepe pasta, men and thai, thai butts. And the best part of all, a week with me. <laughs> okay, I'll see you later, Shalligators. I'll see you tomorrow. Happy Mother's Day.